The world is a complex place. Even a very general look around reveals this. In every discipline, everywhere we look, we see enormous complexity. This is true in biology, this is true in geology, this is true in technology, this is true in astronomy, even in rocket science. In fact, the world is such a complex place that sometimes when we think about trying to understand it, the mere thought of it is overwhelming. Even something we think we understand, like Ohm's Law, can become very complicated if we begin considering that resistance can be affected by things like light, electron density, or temperature. So how do we begin to analyze any of these things? The answer is we can't, at least not absolutely incomprehensively. We can, however, begin by looking at small pieces of systems or by putting reasonable restrictions on the conditions under which we do an analysis. This function is clearly quadratic. Quadratic functions are not lines. But if we take a small portion of a quadratic function, it is very close to a line. Even if we zoom in quite a bit, the quadratic function and the line are very close to each other. So as long as the variation from the quadratic function is not too large, we can use the line to approximate the function over a small range of values. Looking at a small range of values of a nonlinear function to obtain an approximately linear function is called linearization. Linearization is a technique we use to simplify the analysis of a complex function or system and is valid as long as we don't try to extend its validity beyond the range or conditions we initially assumed when making the approximation. We could also look at Ohm's law. Ohm's law will hold true for a resistor as long as we use that resistor in a way it's designed to be used. If a resistor is designed to dissipate up to a quarter watt of power, as long as we don't try to dissipate more than a quarter watt of power, it will behave as we expect, and we expect voltage, resistance, and current to obey Ohm's law. Ohm's law is a linear equation, so we expect to see a linear relationship between current and voltage when applied to a resistor. This does hold true, so our basic electrical systems have a property of linearity. All linearity means is that our system, in our case a circuit, is governed by linear relationships. There are limitations to this linearity, but we are not going to concern ourselves with that for a while, if ever. When we can describe a system as linear, there are properties the system has that make it easier to analyze. One of those properties is scalability. Scalability can be illustrated in the following way. Let's say we have a circuit with a 12 volt source, and that source caused the output voltage to be 4 volts. If we take the same circuit and apply a 36 volt source, since the input is increased by a factor of 3, the output will be increased by a factor of 3. The output of the circuit would then be 12 volts. Sometimes we can actually use this idea to analyze the circuit. If we have this circuit and we want to determine the voltage marked VO, we could start by pretending we don't know what the value of the source is. Then we can assume a voltage across the 20 ohm resistor. We could, for example, assume 20 volts and then determine what the consequences would be. Starting with 20 volts across 20 ohms, that would give us a current of 1 amp. The current through the 20 ohm resistor must come from the 10 ohm resistor. 1 amp through 10 ohms gives 10 volts. Then we can go around the loop. 20 volts plus 10 volts equals 30 volts. 30 volts across 5 ohms gives us 6 amps. Those two currents must come through the 20 ohm, so 1 amp plus 6 amps equals 7 amps. 7 amps through 20 ohms is 140 volts. 30 volts plus 140 volts equals 170 volts. So if the source had been 170 volts, the output would be 20 volts. By linearity, the ratio of the actual VO to the source of the 16 volts must be the same. So a 16 volt source results in an output voltage of 1.88 volts. Now, this is not a very practical way to analyze circuits, but it does illustrate the point. In a linear system, scalability is true. Another property of linear systems is that if a linear system has multiple stimuli, the response of the system will be the sum of its response to each of the individual stimulus. This probably would not surprise us if we took the last circuit and split the 16 volt source into two 8 volt sources. We can clearly see that two 8 volt sources in series result in a 16 volt source. So using two 8 volt sources will give us the same result. However, this may be more difficult to see if the sources are not touching or are of different types. Let's look at the following example just to illustrate this concept. I do want to emphasize that right now I'm just trying to illustrate a concept. I'm not trying to give you an efficient way to solve circuits. With that in mind, let's first analyze this circuit using node voltage analysis so that we know the answer we should get. This circuit can be analyzed with a single node equation. As always, we start by choosing a reference node and then identify the other nodes. The node on the left is connected to a voltage source that is connected to the reference node, so the voltage at the non-reference node must be the value of the source. The voltage at the other node is clearly Vx. If then I draw a direction for the current through the 6 kilo ohm resistor and then draw the current through the 14 kilo ohm resistor so it agrees with the passive sign convention, we can write a node equation. Solving this node equation results in a value of Vx that is 35 volts. 
So now let's analyze this circuit looking at the contributions of each source individually to Vx. To look at an individual source's contribution, I need to turn off all but one source in the circuit. And I am using the phrase turn off all but one source very intentionally. If we keep in mind that we are turning off sources, we will avoid some very common errors. If I turn off a voltage source, that means where that source was, I will now have zero volts. Saying that I have zero volts between two nodes is the same as saying those nodes are connected. So turning off the voltage source results in a wire being placed where the voltage source was. Also, since I am not analyzing the whole circuit right now, I'm going to put a prime on all the variables just to keep them straight. If I want to know the voltage Vx prime, it will be very easy to determine if we know the current through the 14 kilo ohm resistor. We can then use Ohm's law. Just so we are sure we're looking at the circuit correctly, let's identify the nodes. Since there are only two nodes in the circuit, everything is in parallel. The current through the 14 kilo ohm resistor is easily determined using current division. This results in a current of Ix prime equals 1.5 milliamps which results in Vx prime being equal to 21 volts. Going back to the original circuit, let's now look at the contribution to Vx from the 20 volt source. To do that, we need to turn off the 5 milliamp source. Turning off a current source results in no current through the branch that contained the source. This is the same as replacing that source with an open circuit. Let's call the voltage from this portion of the circuit Vx double prime so that we don't confuse it with the other variables. We can solve for Vx double prime by doing voltage division. This results in Vx double prime equals 14 volts. Going back to the original circuit, the total value of Vx is equal to the individual contributions from the sources. So Vx will be equal to Vx prime plus Vx double prime, or 21 volts plus 14 volts, which is equal to 35 volts. The principle that the total response of a linear network is equal to the sum of responses to each of the individual sources in the circuit is called superposition. Now about superposition as a method of solution. In general, this is not a method of analysis that I would consider a shortcut or a quick trick to get a solution. In fact, when we're first learning this principle, analyzing circuits with superposition generally increases the number of steps and the time it takes to get a solution. So why do we bother learning it if it does not simplify our analysis of circuits? Well, because there are situations where it is necessary for analysis. A simple example of this would be a circuit that contains both AC and DC sources. In this case, it becomes extremely difficult to analyze the effect of both sources at the same time. In more complicated circuits, it may be nearly impossible to analyze a circuit with all of the sources in the circuit. There are also many components that respond differently to DC voltages and currents versus AC voltages and currents. An example of this would be a capacitor, which we'll learn about later. To DC currents and voltages, a capacitor looks like an open circuit. To time varying signals, a capacitor can look like anything from a short circuit to a nearly open circuit depending on how quickly that signal varies in time. One of the most common situations for us to apply the principle of superposition is in semiconductor circuits. Semiconductor circuits are those that contain things like diodes and transistors. When we analyze circuits that have semiconductor components, we generally begin by finding a DC solution. Then that DC solution is used to determine the parameters for our AC analysis. The topic of semiconductors brings us to something important we have to discuss before we leave the topic of superposition. If you remember several videos back, I was talking to you about some things called dependent sources. Dependent sources were not the invention of evil maniacal teachers but instead they're used to model the response of and to simplify the analysis of more complicated components like transistors. If dependent sources are used to model a response, that means they must always be present in a circuit to determine if they have a response. This means we can never turn off the dependent source or remove it from the circuit when doing an analysis. Something that can help us remember this comes from looking at the different types of dependent sources. Looking at the four different types of dependent sources, the current controlled current source, the current controlled voltage source, the voltage controlled current source, and the voltage controlled voltage source, we see they have one thing in common, and that is, the symbol representing them is a diamond. And we all know, diamonds are forever. In case I have not made this clear, you can never turn off a dependent source. I'm guessing an example problem would be helpful right now. So here's a circuit with a dependent source. Once again, I would like to point out that superposition is not an efficient means of solving this problem, but this is a simple example to demonstrate how superposition would be done with a dependent source in the circuit. To use superposition to solve for VQ, we need to analyze a contribution to VQ from each of the independent sources. Let's start by looking at the response due to the 3 milliamp source. To do that, we turn off the 30 volt source. We turn off the source by making the voltage 
voltage of the source zero, and that is the same as replacing it with a wire. So let's start by highlighting the nodes. This makes it easy to see there are only two nodes in the circuit, so there is only one voltage, VQ prime. We can then write a KCL equation at the node highlighted in blue. If we set the currents entering the node equal to the currents leaving the node, we get IY prime plus 4IY prime plus 3 milliamps equals VQ prime over 10 kilo ohms plus VQ prime over 20 kilo ohms. A second equation can be found by relating the controlling parameter to VQ prime. That results in IY prime equals negative VQ prime over 5 kilo ohms. A little bit of algebra will get us to 23 VQ prime equals 60 volts, so VQ prime equals 2.61 volts. Now let's look at the circuit again, this time analyzing the contribution to VQ of the 30 volt source. To do this, we will turn off the independent current source. Turning off the current source results in no current, so this is the same as making the branch of the current source an open circuit. Let's begin this analysis by highlighting the nodes. If I designate the green node as a reference node, the purplish node would be 30 volts. Then the yellow node would be VQ double prime. We could then do an informal node voltage analysis. At the yellow node, we would have the current through the 5 kilo ohm resistor, plus the current through the 20 kilo ohm resistor, plus 4 times IY double prime equal to the current through the 10 kilo ohm resistor. We also have that the controlling parameter IY double prime is equal to 30 volts minus VQ double prime over 5 kilo ohms. Taking these two equations and performing a little bit of algebra results in 23 times VQ double prime equals 630 volts, or VQ double prime equals 27.39 volts. So if we take the results from the first analysis, that VQ prime equals 2.61 volts, and the results from the second analysis, VQ double prime equals 27.39 volts, VQ must be the sum of them, resulting in VQ equal to 30 volts. I encourage you to go back and verify this by analyzing the original circuit using a different method. Let me emphasize that this was a horrible approach to this problem. We could have applied node voltage analysis to the first circuit and been done in less than half the time. That's not why I did this. This analysis is only meant to demonstrate how to do superposition when there's a dependent source in the circuit. In fact, I can safely say that most of the problems you're going to be assigned to learn about superposition could be better approached using another method of analysis. That is not the point of the problems. They are there to help you learn how superposition works. It's kind of like learning how to parallel park. We don't start on a busy street with an expensive car trying to park between two expensive cars. We learn how to parallel park in a parking lot between two shopping carts. In real life, you would never parallel park your car between two shopping carts that would just be silly, but it is a relatively safe way to learn a difficult skill. Anyway, using the principle of superposition, we can analyze the response of a network by looking at the response to each of the individual independent sources in the circuit. This will be a necessary method of analysis for many circuits we will encounter in the future. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Go out and make it a great one.